session from the chat uh, with the uh, with the resource person you would have understood how how lively he is how charming he is and he looks young he looks young but he achieved greater heights and uh, uh, in the recent days you could see that not even the recent days in the recent years you could see that he becomes or he has become the most sought after resource person in the field of uh, literature wherever you go rufus is wanted see uh, particularly i don't know what is his uh, uh, relationship with kerala almost all the all the colleges in kerala they are in need of uh, dr rufus so whenever there is a program whenever there is a pro program in mana college we cannot imagine a program without the presence the august presence of uh, dr rufus thank you even uh, i i organized uh, a conference in our college two of the senior sitting senior professors sitting in the front row they were astonished astonished to, to listen to his lecture even so called professors probably uh, probably uh, rufus doctor i discussed it with roof doctor rufus at the end of the conference even the so called two professors working in the reputed uh, working in the reputed institutions they were not able to take down the notes delivered by dr rufus such a eminent teacher he looks young but he achieved greater heights we are very very happy we are very very happy to have his presence and uh, participants i assure you that when you uh, see one of the comments we uh, it was read out by uh, dr jepriyaka the participant one of the participants he cancelled the appointment of the doctor that means rufus is given importance in the area of literature dr rufus is uh, close to the organizing committee that's why you could see that the presence the august presence of uh, dr armstrong dr uh, uh, marx and dr jepriya and even you see that even our secretary uh, sir is also present i failed to mention i failed failed to mention the morning but i it is my great honor and privilege and i got a call in the afternoon i got a call in call in the afternoon from this eminent personality who was the who was the former member of tamil nadu public service commission and then chairman of uh, right to information act and uh, right now he is the pro chancellor of nurul islam university he is also very much sitting uh, with us and i guess come here to listen to the speech of uh, dr rufus i assure you i assure you that when you leave this uh, the webinar you will have loads and loads of references loads and loads of theories loads and loads of books i assure you so really we are excited that from from our conversation you would have understood how we loved respect uh, for uh, dr rufus and uh, to monitor as as as, as uh, the secretary uh, uh, organizing secretary of this uh, e conference i extend my warm welcome to dr rufus to monitor this afternoon session we have a young enterprising faculty member from our department she is a colleague of mine um see uh, round the clock you probably would have uh, you would have understood we see that uh, any query you have sent to us the next minute it is attended such a way the team is working around the clock and uh, professor rumela is among them and she burns midnight oils to make this program a grand success and the professor vimala is uh, uh, was uh, granted or uh, she received ugc grant for her uh, minor research project on tribal humiliation in select novels of mahasweda devi she is also pursuing a, a doctoral research on on a caribbean writer entitled from annihilation to assimilation as i told you that she is young and promising enterprising teacher in the department of english it is my honor and pleasure
to extend a warm welcome to Professor Vimala, and I invite her, officially invite her, to moderate the post-lunch session. Over to Professor Vimala. Uh, thank, <clears throat> thank you, thank you for your words, sir. Thank you for a warm welcome uh, to. Um, warm good afternoon to all. Uh, I welcome all the participants and members to the day four afternoon session of this international e-workshop on English language teaching and literature, current trends, issues, and challenges. First of all, I express my sincere gratitude to the organizing team, uh, uh, Professor Armstrong, Professor T. Marx, Dr. Jayapriya, Dr. Rama Subaya, and Dr. Dayala Krishnan for giving me an opportunity to moderate in this e-workshop. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Samuel Rufus uh, as a speaker for this afternoon. Uh, he is an young, eminent, and the most distinguished sought after resource person. I strongly say this because um, by this I believe by this time Sar would have hit century or a half century by delivering a lecture on, 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 on virtual platforms. And uh, as uh, Kathleen Norris, a famous American poet and novelist says, just the knowledge that a book, that a good book is awaiting one at the end of a long day makes the day happier. I would say the knowledge that uh, Sir is holding at the one end to deliver it to the other end to the participants or the audience would make this day happier. And uh, more than a uh, most sought after resource person, Sar is more, more modest and more humble human being. What else we need to know more about, uh, more about Rufus sir? And I am very much delighted and I'm very much, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I mean it as a pride on my side to moderate Sir's session this afternoon. And uh, as, as custom demands, I would go for a brief intro of uh, Dr. Samuel Rufus. Sir has started his career as a lecturer with, with the American College Madurai, and later he joined Madras Christian College as assistant professor in the year 2003. His areas of interest are soft skills and communication skills, post-colonial studies, cultural studies, literary theory and criticism, bioregional literature, and UGC net coaching, etc. And academic achievements includes as a student, he is a recipient of University Gold Medal in MA English and winner of the President Venkatraman Gold Medal for Academic Excellence in Bharatasana University, Trichy, from His Excellency, the Governor of Tamil Nadu, Shri P. S. Ramohan Rao. As a faculty, uh, so far he has delivered 116 invited talks and uh, he has uh, delivered lectures as a resource person too. So far, he has authored four books and he has edited seven books. Uh, he is, uh, as a, he, I mean, he is uh, editor in uh, three of the journals. And so far, he has presented 35 papers in uh, national and international conferences. He has published 20 articles in books and journals. And he is also a member in PhD doctoral committee in various universities across Tamil Nadu and Kerala. And he's a member in board of examiners and board of studies in various city colleges and in university across Tamil Nadu and Kerala. And right now he is working, uh, working in his uh, second doctoral degree, I believe. Um, see, as a participants or as the audience, whenever we hear to hear to the lecture in the online platform, we have a tendency or we have been habituated to look after the PPT or to search for the PPT or some online supporting tools. But SAR has the capacity to arrest or, 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 or captivate the audience or the participants with his speech, whatever the number, 500,000 or 1,500 participants, he has the ability to arrest the captivate the audience uh, without any online backup. Such illuminating and inspiring lectures or inspiring will be his lecture. Sir, uh, with this few, with this uh, brief bio note or brief intro, I would uh, uh, take pride in welcoming uh, our resource person, Dr. Samuel Rufus. Sir, the forum is yours. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, ma'am. It's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon 
in this virtual seminar or a webinar and i'm so happy with the partic not only the participants but also the organizing committee a special word of thanks to the organizing committee as cool as ever you can ever see such great stalwarts uh, illustrious minds academics coming together in such a wonderful you know common place platform virtual platform together all gigantic minds big big shots great stalwarts from madras university dr armstrong you know uh, he is so down to earth dr marx uh, dr j priya all you know big shots but so cool last night when we had a trial also i found it that they were so cool so chill so relaxed and this is something that is so special only to literary minds i personally believe with all conviction and the reason is that science professors might not share this warmth this camaraderie that we all share you know as uh, literary beings so that's how we like to call ourselves and so thanks to especially to subarnan for beautifully organizing this wonderful webinar series this workshop and to all the participants for having me here i'll straight away go to uh, the topic at hand and since this is an afternoon and this is a saturday afternoon and the last session of the day i would like to be as brief succinct and give you an overview as possible please remember i'm just tracing the trajectory i'm not going to do an in depth study because even shakespeare one play we do an entire semester i'll just trace the trajectory of history of english literature with special reference to the language component how it has evolved and what are its relevance what is its relevance or importance to literary studies today so i uh, infer or assume a very broad audience comprising of teachers research scholars pg students and uh, even others who are interested in tracing the trajectory of the history of english literature so the first question that comes to us very often is a very simple question why history of english literature why should we go all the way back to the past when we have a whole lot of literatures waiting for our attention even in this present century all indian writers are there american writers british writers a whole entire gamut of them are there why should we go back to the good old past yes that's the answer is quite simple most of us know and just recapping in a, in a minute or so we'll be happy if we know something about the place we live in isn't it we'll be happy if you know something about our parents ah oh, where are they from ah oh, we'll ask dad daddy where are you from mom where did you study sorry so you know having these roots firm behind us will help us to move freely that's a famous dictum that goes to move freely you should be grounded and one simple reason why we do all through the ages the history of english literature is to be firm in our grounding when we discuss any component of literature to our learners to the you know a better audience and secondly right the term uk uh, we always have this problem you no know, united kingdom the united kingdom comprises four you know components or four parts right? so they are we all know right england uh, northern ireland and wales and scotland you know these four combining together form the uk and england is the largest you know country in the uk that's and uh, great the, the term great britain again right, is is not a particular uh, you know geographical enterprise it's a name given to the huge archipelago you know we all know uh, the uk or you know the great british isles it comprises 6000 islands a cluster of 6000 islands right and so you know this these terms little terms they will help us uh, to understand some of the terminologies better and the next question we ask is why periods of english literature why do we classify history of english literature or american uh, american literature into periods why what's the importance of having periods excuse me time is like an ever rolling stream there is no particular pause when it comes to time <coughs> we all know that time goes 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 there is an ebb and flow but why do we compartmentalize into periods simple to understand each age better 
to have a grip on each age better. In those days, in the good old past, a period was based on the rule of a queen or a king. But after that, you know, the, uh, the venerable Bede, he was responsible for classifying periods, you know, based on uh, you know, the, the classification that we have today, you know, BC and AD, Anno Domini in Latin and BC. <coughs> Excuse me. So after that, we have the periods, you know, uh, in the name of either kings or queens or in the name of great stalwarts, writers, impactful people of the particular epoch. In history of English literature, we use two terms predominantly. One is called schools. One is called movements. A school is usually associated with one particular person. <coughs> the Chaucerian school, the school of Pope. One person sets a trend and then the others follow it. The, a movement is based, so that one person there would obviously have a style that is so unique to him or herself. And this style helps them to have a great impact on other literary souls down the ages, the Chaucerian school. Like that, you know, you have, uh, you know, a whole lot of schools, you know, down the ages. So a school is based on particular authors who define that particular age or epoch. Second, we have movements. A movement is not necessarily based on a particular person or an individual, but it is usually based on the milieu. The word milieu, we all know, was coined by Hippolytain, right? Excuse me. Hippolytain in the 1890s, yeah, he gave us the term that means the race, the moment, and the particular time in which you place an author right? The milieu. So a school, I repeat, is based on a single person's influence or maybe, you know, a collective group of people, their influence, especially it is a single person, their, his or her influence on a whole lot of people who come after them. A moment is essentially a product of the social milieu in which it is placed. Romanticism is a movement. <coughs> Excuse me. Transcendence is a movement, right? That um, uh, realism is a movement. Naturalism is a movement. Modernism is a movement. So th these movements are characterized by or conditioned by the milieu in which it grows, right? So this is uh, another important thing that we should have in mind. 1994, Harold Bloom, we all know a very famous critic of the 20th century. He was born, if I'm right, in the year 1930, and he passed away last year. Very old man, a good old man, Harold Bloom, uh, like M. H. Abrams. You know, he also lived for a very long period of time, octogenarian. Harold Bloom wrote a very important book, 580 pages, if I'm right, yeah, 580 pages approximately. It's called The Western Canon, a very important book. There are people who love the Western, the book, you know, it's titled The Western Canon books and school of the ages. There are people who hate the canon. Of course, you know, in post-colonial studies, in subaltern studies, we all, you know, don't like anything that is canonical. But this particular book written in the year 1994 has a beautiful preface and prelude. Please, if you have the time, just read through the preface and the prelude to this book, again written by Harold Bloom, where he says, you know, what defines a writer? What makes a writer legendary? Or what makes a writer canonical? What makes a writer, you know, we use the word USP. What is special about a writer? Why is that writer remembered over a period of time down through the ages, even till today? For example, you know, he, he starts from Dante to Beckett. He gives a list of 26 of his favorite writers from Dante to Beckett, whom he loves. If they ask us, you know, if they ask me, you know, who are your favorite writers right from the past, good old days, till the present? Give us 25. How many writers will we give based on reading them? 
not necessarily knowing about them, but reading them and getting to understand their milieu, their works in the historical context. So he, he, you know, uh, we have this wonderful Greek philosopher of the good old past Heraclitus. He says, you know, unless the mind is washed by a vast stream of literature, it cannot bring forth its offspring. Offspring means a writing. This washing, right, by a vast stream of literature, Harold Bloom has done. We all know the critical guides that he gives us by the hundreds he gives us. In this particular book, in the preface and prelude, he says what makes a writer or an author legendary, canonical. He says, a beautiful phrase that he gives, the depths of inwardness, what Radhakrishnan would call inward subjectivity, the depths of inwardness. What M. H. Abrams, in his glossary to literary terms, he uses the word no style. The depths of inwardness that makes an author legendary. How much they are going into themselves and come out with their own unique words, sentences, thoughts, ideas. And that's what, you know, this depths of inwardness is what makes an author legendary, he says. And every author, according to Bloom, has their own style. Some, their style is predominant. Some, there's, you know, their, their style is very subtle. For some, their style is not overtly visible. It is, once you read them again and again, you will understand their style. So every, every writer has their own style. M. H. Abrams, again, in this wonderful book, Glossary of Literary Terms, he defines style in a very beautiful way. I've always you know, said this because I love the way he defines style. He says it in a very simple way. He says, style is how they say what they say. I repeat, style means how they say what they say. If, it, for example, I say Rajnigant has a style, Kamal Hassan has a style, or any writer for that matter. Style. How they say matters. Next comes what they say. So every writer will have their style. And he says, uh, he uses a phrase, it is called anxiety of influence. I'm using this word particularly because this phrase, particularly because he, he places William Shakespeare at the middle or the pivot or the center of this canon. And you know why he does that? He says, because Shakespeare, every writer who writes is influenced by someone who has come before her or come before him. Every writer who writes, he says, is influenced by someone, you know, Julia Kristeva uses the word intertextuality. Uh, Bhaktin uses the word heteroglossia. Uh, somehow or the other, we are under the influence. For example, you write something, I write something. He says, we are influenced by the social milieu, by the culture, by the language, by the, you know, the reality that is given around us, the advertisements, everything around us. He says, this is called anxiety of influence. The word anxiety means extremes of fear. When I write, for example, I start, you know, earth is not anything. Oh, no. Wordsworth has already written it. Then I write another, you know, uh, another opening line. Uh, it was the best of times. Oh, no. Charles Dickens has written it, Tale of Two Cities. I have this anxiety that I should not imitate anyone else when I, I have this fear in me. Shakespeare was the only writer, according to Harold Bloom, who was untouched by this anxiety. So what makes an author legendary? We'll see Chaucer is, you know, the, we, we call him the well of English, undefiled, pure well of English. He gave us our English. Over a period of time, we find each writer has their hallmark or style or what is called USP that makes them special. Quickly, going through the past, I'll, in, in about 10 to 15 minutes, I'll take you through the realm of language. How language has conditioned all the writers over a period of time and its relevance today. Right? 
So the history of English literature quickly, we call it the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age, right? It starts like that, the Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age. In the mid first century, when the start of the Iron Age comes, then you have, right? Britain was a nation. The Britain was a nation filled with invaders. I, I repeat this word, Britain was the land which was filled with invaders. The first people who were there in the mid first century were, were called Celtics. We write it as C-E-L-T-I-C, but it is pronounced as Celtic because the, the word is K-E-L-T-O-N-I-C, Keltonic, or, you know, Galatonic. The word Galatians also comes from them. They were invaders. Please remember this word, invaders. They were all warriors. They, so they came into, they, they came into, you know, what is called, uh, you know, England. They were there and they settled there over a period of time. And please remember the word Britain comes from the word Brittany, P-R-I-T-A-N-Y. The word Brittany in Celtic means painted. So they were tribes. They were tribes who painted themselves. They were called the tattooed people. They had tattoos on them based on the degrees, degrees in the sense, degrees in life. They had tattoos painted on them. So the word Britain comes from the word Brittany, which means painted. And they were there, not, we can't call them the first settlers. Please remember, there is no such concept called first when it comes to history of English literature or theory or criticism. Svivak, when she was asked the question, who do you think were the first settlers in India? She said, my son, don't use the word first. No one has known for sure who came here first. You can, if you want, use the word earliest. Right? So here, the earliest known as far as you know, dating is concerned were the Celtics. But you know, after 43 AD, things changed. The Romans invaded. I repeat, they invaded. Right? Britain, they came in, they settled. They were, again, you know, uh, they had a great influence on the land. And we all know how the Roman language, right? Latin became very dominant for the next 400 years, quickly going. So first it was Celtic Britain. Then in 43, you know, uh, uh, 43 AD, then it, it, uh, after 43 AD, it became Romano Britain. The Roman influence was there. Then after 450 AD, you have the Anglo-Saxon conquest. So the Angles, the Saxons and the Jutes, they were a Germanic tribe, you know, Northern Germany. They again invaded, they settled here. So Britain belongs to who? So they settled here, they gave their language. Please remember the English that we have today is, comes from the word Angles. The word Angles, Angla land, Ingla land, England, English. That's how it comes, right? The Angles played a very important role. And two people I'll just like to mention very quickly. One is called Bede, right? In uh, 731 AD, he, he was a historian. Right? He's called the father of English history. We know him, right? Venerable Bede. You know? So he, you know, he gave us uh, what is called the first history of the English people. History. And King uh, Alfred the Great, you know, we use the epithet the Great, Alfred the Great. He also helped, you know, people get education. That's why he's called the Great. You know, he was very much interested in translating Latin works into English. He was very much interested in the welfare of the masses in uplifting the masses and so he followed you know the previous uh, income you know uh, beads uh, model and he uh, had a chronological account we call it the anglo-saxon chronicle so english the old english was there and then quick forward to 1066 ad the norman conquest the french the version of you know the norman invasion was there william the conqueror came in english was marginalized, a Norman French was there, which became the language of the courts. Now, the, there is a crisis. English of the Anglo-Saxon period, which we call Old English, was not written in popular parlance. Of course, two or three historians were there who wrote down, but majority of them who wanted to write in English, although it was their native tongue, 
they had it only as orature you know orature means you know oral songs because latin was popular the language of the court it became widespread in society so anything printed if you want to be popularized if you want to get popular you better you know embrace latin or what is called a, a norman french so this happened in the year 1066 and quickly going forward we all know chaucer in english i'm not going into that i come to the year 1490 i told you tracing the trajectory of history, the history of english literature from the language point of view and how much importance it has for our uh, present day where the, the the importance that is at right 1490 a very important year because many humanists from england they all you know six of them they went where to italy that's why the english renaissance which starts from 1500 is called the italian renaissance we know that right it's called the italian renaissance because from here six great scholars they went to italy they went to france padua bologna you know a whole lot of places they went and why did they go there because of their love for knowledge because of their great passion for knowledge they went there and why did they go there because constantinople fell to the ottoman turks and treasures of knowledge rich books greeks in uh, in greek and latin classical you know all classics they were almost about to be destroyed you know the first thing that an invader does is you know destroy the libraries that's what henry the 8th also did you know very later so uh, what happened was you know the, when when it fell to the ottoman turks the great classics they were taken by some fugitive greeks into italy and there was a great love for learning the classics because the classics were something so peculiar they had you know unique traits of knowledge in them so what happened was people from england they went there i'll just mention four of them for us because they are very important for us uh, we must not have known them but we respect them we salute them because uh, you know they took the initiative to go you know all the way there from the history of english literature perspective right they went there and they studied they sat there they studied toiled hard and then they came back here to oxford established the centers of greek and latin now please remember the english language has more than 14 lakh words one in every four words spoken is greek has a greek root one in every two words spoken has a latin root right so almost every word in english you can split them up into its etymological derivation you will find right either latin or greek influences there we have a problem with you know vocabulary we have a problem in spelling we have a problem in pronunciation in english not in local languages in hindi you won't have it in malayalam you don't have it in tamil you don't have it but in french you have it in english you have it right p e n c h a n t we don't say it as penchant it is penchant the, there is a crisis in pronunciation the spelling and the pronunciation they vary they, they don't match many ask us this question d e b t right we don't call debt we call it debt b o m b we don't say bomb we call it bomb right? the b at the end is silenced many ask us these questions right so when you trace this roots we can give them answers in a better way thanks to the great influence of greek and latin on english they went to what is called you know um, italy six scholars uh, and they learned the classics there they read the classics there they learned greek they learned latin there and then they came back into you know what is called uh, england and they established centers of greek established centers of latin and then that is how english went hand in hand with what is called greek and latin so the first person i would uh, say is linacre l i n a c r e linacre the second person is grossin g r o c y n right just remember linacre and grossin if you keen on uh, google you'll get the names 
but when you get answers please don't go to wikipedia for an answer i have told my research scholars or students you know for the past 18 19 years i've told them this even if the last knowledge source in the world got to be destroyed and you have only knowledge source in the whole world that is wikipedia popping up please don't look at wikipedia because it is a very good initiative a noble initiative but still for authentic references it can it can prove a major disaster some so a few years back a student you know uh, of history he wanted to research a war between uh, the marath um, you know maharashtra and uh, <clears throat> uh hyderabad so he went into wikipedia and imagined what that was not there at all right was put up as if a great battle had happened you know thousands of soldiers were killed and then he researched how did this war happen between the maratha warriors and and people in hyderabad you know if you want deccan warriors but how did this happen it when did this happen no book of history that i have referenced for the past 6 years gives me you know something of this and then when he you know keyed in a whole lot of information went into authentic sources he found out that it was a fake page meant to deceive people so please you know don't go into wikipedia go into you know authentic sources online pdf books online linacra grossin the established centers of greek in oxford right oxbridge you know we can call it in those days centers of learning and uh, you know lily uh, l i l y you know Lily, another famous person, along with Collett, they set up centers of Latin. How did they do that? They went all the way there. Great learning comes only when you have a great, you know, journey or a quest. The quest could be, you know, literal. The quest could be metaphorical. You know, unless you have a great journey or a quest for knowledge, you know, great. matram or you know change in society transformation can never happen right and they are best examples for that erasmus especially 16 years he was there his friend more you know thomas more right so i gave you um, two first scholars were linacre and grossin they gave us study established the study of greek come on most of the words that we have today in medicine in astronomy in uh, academics are from greek right any word beginning with ped any word beginning with astro means star any word beginning with ped <coughs> pad means child ped means foot right all these etymologies if you were to trace logos means study right again greek when we know these roots you know for the 14 lakh words it's easy you know at, at least 300 to 400 roots if we can know them it helps us to understand how our language came to us and how you know we can train our students better when it comes to vocabulary the vocabulary part so you know and call it in lily they established centers in latin in england then erasmus and more they also studied very passionately in um, you know um, greek and latin and they also propagated the new learning they called it and so you have you know uh, linacre grossin call it lily and the two important ones are erasmus and more because thomas more gave us a wonderful book a phenomenal book that he dedicated to his friend uh, erasmus and this book is called utopia 1516 it was written again in latin please remember the latin influence on english is very heavy the latin alphabet is the english alphabet even the international phonetic alphabet that you have in the 19th century if i'm right in the year 1888 is based entirely on the latin alphabet not the english alphabet right all the letters there and greek of course had a great influence on latin the 23 letters on greek the other day one of my you know students in, in i went to a school where a, uh, one of the participants asked me a question so how many letters are there in english i gave them a lecture after the lecture he asked me how many letters are there in english i said you know 26 letters then he asked me the next question <coughs> excuse me so why is a the first letter why is b the second letter why not y the first letter x the second letter honestly i didn't have an answer this was you know a few years back 
so they today you know today's children are very very wise intelligent shrewd they ask us a whole lot of questions and here am i a teacher of english are trying to teach english <clears throat> not knowing these elementary rudiments why a is the first letter why b the second letter i was so vexed with myself <clears throat> not um, you know able to answer a little boy then i went uh, to almost all the libraries that i possibly could kanimara right uh, usually we go no to the libraries went there i couldn't get any information to be honest david crystal has written an encyclopedia on language he has also written an encyclopedia on english language he didn't give me answers i went to you know uh, many one particular shop in velachery in chennai uh, where i got right a wonderful book <clears throat> it's called words stories and the romantic origins by wilfred funk that book is a revelation when i opened that book i was so thrilled because in that book there was an answer for the question that boy had asked me why a is the first letter greek a means alpha the first letter why a is you know the symbol a is placed the way it is like a triangle why is it that way there is a beautiful story behind that if we have the time towards then maybe i can tell you some of these stories b beth the second letter why is it the second letter why not see the second letter again from greek right beta right b e t a it also means beth beth means house bethlehem means house of bread why is it placed like two semi circles one below the other a beautiful story behind that so knowing the roots of these stories helps us to engage with not only the language but also the literature that this language reveals for us so you know the erasmus he also you know wrote a few books one important book that he wrote in 1500 was adages Adage, adages means proverbs we all know what are the adages stitch in time saves nine right uh, so uh, make uh, haste makes waste make hay while the sun shines these are all adages given by erasmus you know the prince of the humanists we call him you know um, erasmus and uh, erasmus dedicated his book to uh, thomas more and thomas more dedicated his utopia to him and most of the writing those days were in latin of course chaucer also we know right had his uh, latin period of writing before he took to english after erasmus uh, after thomas more there was what is called a crisis right a great crisis happened uh, the, the reformation the crisis of the reformation happened and in this period education is please remember the renaissance was basically about language although it affected all aspects of social life arts basically the premise was on language what in 1966 derrida would have us believe the power of language in shaping discourse what foucault would have us believe so you know uh, this latin influence and greek influence from then on became predominant in all writings that came from then on shakespeare first act first scene you know uh, there is a there is a soliloquy where uh, you know hamlet uh, when you know they analyzed this particular soliloquy they found out the first soliloquy right they found out that 19 percentage of the words there are latin latin derivation why is that because you know they devoured the classics and how did they devour the classics when shakespeare knew little latin and no greek how did they devour the classics yes the renaissance helped muster in a huge variety of translations from the classics there were great translators in you know in england one is called uh, hall right uh, you know there, there are many translators one is called philemon holland he was called the translator general of the age he was a great translator all the classics were translated into english and that's why even today we say read translated classics dr marx has translated a classic from tamil to english most of you must have known it dr armstrong had a great celebration a book release for that translated classics 
have a great say because even last year's yeah um, 2018 nobel prize right olga tokarczuk she got a nobel for the translation right a polish writer translated into english when i read you know the moment she was announced as the winner you know two winners were announced no last year so when she was announced as the winner till then honestly you know i didn't know who this writer was olga o l g a a polish writer 1962 born if i'm right so you know i didn't know about this writer but when i started reading it it was as if i was experiencing the life she had written in her native language first hand the power of translations shakespeare knew little latin and no greek but still almost all his plays you will have this influence he all, always you know although they say he was untouched by any you know anxiety or any influence right pg woodhouse one of my favorite writers says uh, you know about shakespeare there is a board hanging outside plot for sale beware shakespeare might lift it plot for sale beware shakespeare might lift it of course shakespeare lifted he took everything from these translated classics but still he he had this depths of inwardness that made him original so these translations nourished the whole of renaissance from the you know and that is why the tragedies in english if you read them analyze them dissect them you will find they have the latin influence seneca was the model for tragedy when we read you know any tragedy uh, in you know shakespeare tragedy we will see the senecan influence because you know senecan tragedies were basically called oratorical tragedies long monologues will be there soliloquies will be there but greek tragedies were not like that they were meant for action only action was there but you know the seneca was a dangerous model because he wrote only orat long soliloquies you know seneca we all know stood for stoicism and so his tragedies you know shakespeare you have seven i think there are seven soliloquies in hamlet oh that this solid flesh will melt and dissolve uh, to be or not to be that is the question whether to be noble you know all these soliloquies you have and thanks to right the influence we had influences shakespeare was very much influenced by these translations and one more influence on english literature in the middle ages in the, during the renaissance was the histories or the chronicles that were written a whole lot of chronicles are written in england shakespeare read all of them devoured them and these chronicles helped them have their own version so there were two conquests if we could call it that way 1066 the norman conquest 1476 the conquest that happened through printing because printing standardized one particular dialect and made it popular there is a difference between standard and standardized right chaucer gave us a standard dialect like dante you know gave a standard dialect for them in italy here chaucer gave us a standard dialect for england that's why he is called the well of english undefiled after chaucer right there was a standardization we there is a difference between standard and standardization isn't it they used you know one particular hotel which has a lot of chains and i don't want to name them uh, no advertisements right so a particular chain of hotels in tamil nadu in dubai in you know a whole lot of places in the in washington dc you know these hotel chains they have a standardized food means right the chutney the taste of the chutney that i have here with my dosa will be the same taste that i have right in washington dc also standardized means you know making it common throughout this standardization happened with printing press and after that the, the 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 derivation that we get from latin and greek was diffused into the english language and almost all the words from then on were standardized based on the latin and the greek influence shakespeare wrote it after that milton he learned his latin and greek please remember till 1828 english was not prescribed in any university or any college the first college to prescribing uh, you know english as a subject of study not literature was in 1828 kings college london 
before that english in, english was not prescribed because they thought it didn't have any use value so this standardization after that a whole lot of writers i'm not going into all of them because you know we have other aspects to discuss this standardization from then on caught up in 1611 1611 the king james version of the scriptures the bible helped in com in, in popularizing because every home had it at the scriptures it helped in popularizing one variety of english as you know the common variety the book of common prayer again 1649 if i'm right from then on a standardization happened after milton you have alexander pope right pope also right he was an ardent lover of the classics uh you know he read latin he read greek like uh, milton again right in milton you will have these latin and greek influences are more more pronounced right pope popes in popes essay messiah was translated into latin by samuel johnson right samuel johnson again you have this influence right that comes uh, you know very late then i'll now come into the year 1776 we all know why 1776 is very important just last week uh, across the atlantic they had huge celebrations on 4th of july because america got its independence 1776 that year is not important for us from the history of english literature perspective it has a great significance because of the language component the language which was approximately born you know uh, in 1066 we are not very please remember periods of english literature that we classify Uh, are not very you know fixed ones 1066 morning you wake up and you don't start speaking a new language it's not like that it appeared very gradually but we have these years for a classification even today there is still controversy about which is the first comedy in uh, english right is it you know ralph royster doister or you no know, was it 1533 or 1585 we don't know still there is a controversy so you know coming to the year 1776 united states of america was born there are a whole lot of problems that led to the you know the stamp act problem was there a whole lot of problems was there king george the 3rd was supposed to be a lunatic in england so things contributed 13 colonies came together and they proclaimed independence from then started disaster for the english language which is a very young language with all due respect for english let's go into our languages you know local languages you will never have this problem of difference in spelling and pronunciation in malayalam in tamil in hindi you will never have this problem right write a word the same way you write it you pronounce it you will never skip a word you will never skip a you know a vowel nothing like that but in english you do that and you know the reason or the culprit behind all this is because english is not a pure language the english that we have today is a derivative language right borrowed heavily from two other languages that is uh, greek and latin greek came first and then latin even the english alphabet is the latin alphabet exactly from i but you know latin had 23 if i'm right but you know i was made into j and uh, u was made v and w and we had 26 letters later so this interesting part in 1776 a very young language that was just coming up divided into two because you know people across the you know uh, in the united states did not like to be monitored to be bossed by their uh, you know their english counterparts they wanted to be a free land they didn't want to be under anybody's subjection especially the kings or the queens subjugation or subjection so they declared independence and 1806 noah webster we can't call him the culprit right he wanted to give a unique english for the americans and he came out with this first dictionary which was which later became a very popular dictionary in the year you know 1828 it became a very you know standard version of uh, a dictionary of american english see a dictionary of english we have in oxford but here it is called american english 17 um 1828 and what is special about this dictionary is that 
it gave us weird words that no one ever thought of for example i'm just giving you a few words a police in england they say we don't want to use the word police we'll use the word cop train in england tram car there pound in england dollar there post in england mail you have yahoo mail you have gmail you have garbage here trash there first floor here down ground floor for them west is inner garment for us west is outer garment for them we have the right side steering wheel deliberately they had it on the left side because they want to be different from them in every aspect of life and in language part three particular areas are of interest for us one is vocabulary one is spelling the third one is pronunciation there is a humorous you know a quote that says you no know, how do you differentiate a, a british uh, britisher from an american an english uh, you know speaker from an american speaker just give them the word g o d if he says god he is british if he says gad he is american right so you know they say even in pronunciation even in spelling because webster wanted to simplify spelling he wanted to simplify pronunciation the word public uh, in old english it was called ck it ended with ck music it ended with ck but webster said let's simplify the language when the british you know even today you'll find victorian sensibility especially they have a lot of formalities uh, you know associated with the language how, how you have to curtsy how you have to say hello how you have to have a particular style on you when you speak you know just have a look at the queen you know in the past videos even if if you know god forbid even if a flea were to bite her she will not turn her head immediately she'll have to gracefully turn like this right and that was because they had what is called this etiquette to be followed in public please go to oxford dictionary and type out the word a tissue even when you sneeze there is a proper format for that a t i s h o o oxford dictionary tells you not i right i'm not joking so when i sneeze i should not say hatch or butch i should say a tissue they have etiquette for that the americans wanted to be free from all these dogmas these false sense of prudery or refinement these you know all these etiquette they wanted to be free land so they wanted to simply richard ledra you know uh, he has written books on language where he says let's simplify why do you want to use long words when you can use very short words why do you want to use you know high sounding phrases sometimes in our research we do that no birds of a same feather flock together this is what i want to convey in my phd in my research but what do i do i want the examiner to be confused like anything you know the former president of america dr truman says if you cannot convince them confuse them right if you cannot convince them confuse them so what i do is to confuse everyone i use very high bombastic words birds of the same feather flock together but you know refinement says ornithological specimens of identical plumage congregate concurrently this artifice was a great border for the americans they wanted to simplify that's why even words like color c o l o u r why do you want to add an extra u they said school s c h o o l why that c there why does it come there you know most of these problematics they try to simplify it not only in vocabulary you know where you have different words right here uh, uh, a biscuit there you know you know the word for biscuit there cookie right Co uh, chocolate here candy bar there uh, different words that we use right one reason why the americans don't play cricket is because england english people are known uh, cricket buffs right so one maybe one reason so they wanted to be peculiar because of the power of language now look at this right from the first century ad 43 ad it was celtic britain uh, or you know the exact pronunciation be celtic britain 
Then forty-three, you had Romano Britain. Then Germanic Britain in four hundred and fifty, or Anglo-Saxon. Anglo-Saxon means Germanic Britain. Then again, you have Norman French Britain. See the influences. Each, you know, many have this doubt. Why do we call the live animal goat, the meat of that animal mutton? Stories can be found here because the Anglo-Saxon shepherds they shepherded the goats, the sheep, but they didn't. They didn't have the luxury of eating them, the meat of them. You know, simply we can call it goat meat. Why do you say mutton? Reason is, you know, the Anglo-Saxons reared these animals. but they were not eaten by them they were eaten by the nobility the norman french nobility at the courts they had a word for goat meat that was called mutton so the english word will be you know the native word the live animal like you know um, any animal live english word will be there the meat pork for example right uh, would be the the dead animal the meat would be of course of the borrowed word right the norman french or it will be some other word see the influence and this a whole lot of confusions also happened synonyms existed in english the birth of synonyms wedding and marriage both are the same injury wound both are the same but you know because of these parallel synonyms that existed together we had a lot of variety our people are known for giving stories no so the word injury we now today you know um, we have a book for that english vocabulary news by cambridge it tells us you know the word injury means you you know accidentally fall down hurt yourself it is injury someone deliberately you know pokes at you or does something to you it's called a wound so when you go to the hospital the doctor will ask you the first question is is it an injury or a wound if you say injury okay come in you can be admitted if you say no it's a wound who attacked you go file a fir and come to the hospital they'll say synonyms happened because of the parallel existence of the native tongue along with the the, the foreign tongue of the invader please remember i used the word warriors for celtics and then the romans were called invaders invaders means right they come surreptitiously discreetly or secretly they come in and they settle so now coming to this crisis that we have in the year 1776 and 1828 when noah webster came out to this unique american english whole pandemonium the word coined by milton pandemonium ensued please remember dr johnson and you know after that you know even to tennyson they all were very familiar well versed in latin and in greek wordsworth's poems you will find this influence this lat charles lamb you will find a whole lot of you know latin analogies will be there greek analogies will be there the romantic poets the romantic movement especially and even the augustan age the age of pope otherwise called the augustan age because they went back to the classics greek and latin in the 19th century again you have this revival the celtic revival now the irish literary revival not only in ireland but also in england that right? you have this revival going back to the classics going back to the roots so 1828 you have there is a you know there is a crisis americans spelt a word differently the english people spelt differently they wrote different complete chaos they didn't want they didn't bother at all the americans that right, uh, they don't care a heck about you know all that happens here in this part so because of the increase in trade global commerce was expanding you know the whole world was slowly opening up to maritime maritime trade a whole lot of things are opening up so this crisis had to be stemmed or nipped in the bud that's when in the year 1888 we have the international phonetic association was founded and uh, uh, the ipa international phonetic alphabet was given to us we all know how many sounds are there all the sounds in the whole wide world have been given to us as 44 sounds right 107 letters are there if i'm right right again based on the latin alphabet not the english alphabet 
if you look at the phonetic notations it is not english it is based on the latin because latin also had upper case lower case right if you look at uh, the story of latin it's so interesting and that's how you know in 1888 we had what is called right uh, a standardized variety in pronunciation so if anyone asks us why is put called put but but called but you can immediately say look at the ipa that has set us the norm because maybe a chinese person you know a person from china or a person from south korea will try to pronounce it differently we have a lot of south koreans every year coming to you know mcc to learn english i was one of the first batch of trainers to teach them it was a bit difficult for us to train them you know some 5 6 7 years back right if i'm right it was very difficult to train them because they were completely you know uh, 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 acclimatized to their native language no introduction whatsoever to english so this acclimatization made them difficult to learn english it was oh boy it was a bit challenging but so lovely kids they were very soon they were able to pick up and then we gave them so in the 20th century and from then on you few find you know a whole lot of you know eliot himself calls him no calls himself a classicist in literature a royalist in politics a classicist in literature catholic in religion he proudly says you know so this classicism going back and looking at you know uh, the the classics that gave us our language and how it conditions the literature of every age be it johnson be it wordsworth be it dryden be it pope be it milton be it tennyson be it eliot you have all these influences and the reason was that they wanted to you know as uh, mahatma gandhi once said i don't want my house to be walled on all sides walled means you know completely closed on all sides i want my house to be open let all the cultures of the world and that is one reason why we tell right in theory we tell without knowing anything about another language please don't pass your judgments on another language what in theory we say without knowing anything about a person don't pass judgments on a person it is it is anathema it is bad you know only one language or two languages you say anything good about that language i appreciate you for that but please don't have the guts or the audacity to say something bad about a language that you don't know and this is the, the uh, this is a wonderful lesson we learn in literature when we go back to the past and find that our own language 90% of the world wide work today is saturated with what we call the english language a language that is relatively young very young compared to the great classics classical languages we call them right uh, greek or latin or sanskrit daniel jones included you know these three languages as the classical languages without knowing anything about for example kannada i don't have any right to say anything wrong about kannada without knowing anything about hindi or its literature i cannot say anything bad you know it applies to any language it applies to any theory it applies to any person this inclusivity that literature teaches us right that's why we say no literature transforms the way we look at society the way we look at people it tells us that even our own language is not original postmodernism Lyotard, in his wonderful 1978 book, *The Postmodern Condition: A Report on Knowledge*, in this book he says, "No, I strongly suspect grand narratives. Grand narratives means that say there is only one truth, only single truth. How many years it took us over a period of time, right? I, I remember the first time when I was asked to teach post-colonial studies, 2003, uh, for my students." when i was encountering this particular poem a fisherman mourned by his wife the color complexion comes the dark how darkness 
conditions a person into the sidelines marginalizes them we have been doing it in theory over a period of time and this year for the first time fair and lovely says we are going to strike off the word fair from advertisements if literature transforms our sensibilities that means you and i as literary souls have a great power in us that's why always we always say you no know, literature people make the best husbands the best wives the best siblings the best friends the best you know teammates anything you call them literature people will be the first there and because that's because their mind is washed by a very vast stream of literature the romantic movement one sentence you know uh, like uh, in hamlet you have a one sentence you no know, that sums up the renaissance what is that uh, you know in hamlet there is a there is a beautiful line where he says um, you know this um, i i forget that right i'll i'll come to that later yes uh, in wordsworth during the romantic age beautiful sentence he says bliss was it in the dawn to be alive but to be young was so beautiful one sentence that sums up the romantic spirit of course you know almost every writer who comes after the romantic movement then the you know the next movement that comes after that as a reaction to romanticism that is realism they were attacking a whole lot of these romantic uh, creeds and the basic yardstick that they used was again language why do you use a romanticized version of language they asked make it simple make it simple right so realism uh, once in manna uh, thirumala mtn college you know subhanand's college uh, last year i took a potato with me you know on stage i had a potato with me and i showed it to them see this potato with all the mud the clay the sand around it right you can call it naturalism right reality as it is but you know um, that is naturalism you polish the potato right keep it under a halogen light then it is called realism a filtered version of reality language here right is filtered in naturalism it is crude that is why naturalistic you know novels the deal you know on the naturalism mode they are so crude you can't easily read them because they deal with the stark crude realities of society the romantics they did not bother about that even the language was so elevated they did not want to relate to the realistic mode social realism and uh, you know uh, the the realism that you find in the naturalism mode again the modernist movement they again critic language you know um, uh, from t s eliot onwards you find he was he also had this inclusive tendency in him so what are the takeaways from this conditioning that we have seen the imprint of language in our literatures all through any literature that we read we will find this intoxication this influence of latin greek and a whole lot we told you earlier one in every four words in english is obviously right a greek word 50% or one in every two words that we speak in english has a latin influence tamil has given a lot of words to what is called english right maligotony these are words i am not saying they are in the dictionary oxford dictionary right maligotony um, you know calico from calicut uh, many words from malayalam from hindi the word bungalow you know which we call from bengali a whole lot of words from other languages have come into english and they've enriched the language for the better so you know uh, i would give you just two suggestions one is if you have the chance please read uh, a, a few good books on etymology right there are good books on etymology that will help us understand when i read charles slam um uh, you know as part of my course work i couldn't understand him without you know going back to some of these etymologies but when you you know uh, engage with the writer after knowing something of the setting any word you know 
I'll just give you some five or ten examples so that we can relate with any literature better. The word tract, T R A C T, means pull in Latin. Tractor, something that pulls. Attract, pull towards. Distract, die means two, right? Tract means two pullings on each direction. So, you know, pati, the word P A T H Y means feeling, sympathy, feeling for a person, empathy, feeling from a person's perspective, apathy. The word am means no, no feeling. G Y N, right? Again, the Greek word means G Y N, gynecology. G Y N means women. Gynecology, uh, women related study, study of women related issues or things is gynecology. Like that, you know, the word logos means study. Chrono, time, right? Synchronize means same time. Shall we synchronize our watches? Syn means same like synthesis. So this understanding of the roots helps us to engage not only with the literature better, but as Spivak says, our understanding of the world around us would not be complete unless and until we step out of our comfort zones and read literatures from all parts of the world, especially with a grounding on the regional literature. Right? Without a grounding on the region, right? the literature around us, and without this engagement with the literatures from all around the world, our future right? as literary souls, we are, not, you know, we are not doing much to contribute to the future as far as literature is concerned. The way we have carried a rich legacy from the past masters, thanks to their hard work, their engagement with the classics and giving us a language. I'll, I'll again tell you this also. If the past masters from England had gone to China, had gone to Korea, today all our languages would have been hieroglyphics, you know, different. But they went to, you know, Italy. They studied the Greek and Latin masters. We have their influence today and it is there. So most, you know, they say almost 90% of the words in English, approximately. If you cut them, you know, if you split them, you can easily trace the roots it will be either Latin or Greek, you know, um, most of the words. And this engagement with the language, when we do literature, you know, language through literature makes our understanding of literature a bit more comprehensive and engage better with not only the language, but with the literature also. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. That was really a roaring lecture. You, you, you really gave a new insights into uh, origin of alphabets and uh, uh, spellings and the pronunciation and how these evolved into the English language. It was really a wonderful lecture. And um, I think it is the depth of inwardness of towards knowledge that makes you unique. And uh, as Harold Bloom has to say this on Shakespeare, um, untouched with anxiety. Uh, I feel it is untouched by the anxiety of uh, anxiety of redundancy. You pull the audience and audience throng over to hear to your lecture uh, uh, in any platform for that matter. Uh, as one of the participants did today by canceling the appointment uh, with the doctor to uh, uh, sitting here to listen to your lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, that was a really wonderful lecture. And uh, let me move on to the questions, sir. The yes. first question is from uh, uh, Buell, Dr. Bula from Meenakshi College, Madurai. Um, are, the, are there connections among Greek, Latin, and Tamil languages? As the Tamil language has its archaic Brahmi symbols and is considered to be the origin of all languages, which stated by the Western, Western researches. Yes. There are still, you know, um, we have not come out with authentic proofs on that, but there are still researchers going on that in that connection. Because, you know, it took a Daniel Jones to come out to the commonalities in Sanskrit, pita, you know, for example, in Latin also you have peta. In Greek also it has the word p. Fra, fra F-R-A means, you know, something connected with brother. And uh, again, you know, so these commonalities you find even 
in tamil also so uh, you are right and these connections are being done you know even the tamil university is doing a lot of wonderful research on that subject even last year one of my good friends told me on that but nothing has come out quantitatively you know qualitative research is going on it has not come out but much re remains to be done and that i think will be a very engaging research it's like you know uh, telugu and kannada you have a lot of commonalities you know the script um uh, tamil and malayalam because i know some malayalam also so tamil and malayalam you will find most of the letters you have commonalities ka for example right many words wa for example almost the same as tamil bengali and hindi you know there is a connect so when we trace this not only it becomes an engaging exercise but it also helps us to know the beauty of another language better good question yes sir thank you sir uh, the next question is from sangeeta each woman has a significance on the people did the scientific developments and literary movements combine together reflect on contemporary ideas can you explain in brief sir scientific can you repeat that uh, did the scientific developments and literary movements combine together reflect on contemporary ideas yes that's right that's right very true they did reflect on contemporary ideas because in november 24 1859 when charles darwin the naturalist came out with the shocking observations it influenced the same year in a tale of two cities was written it influenced him and in uh, you know a few years late novelists wrote they had the naturalist charles darwin in mind when they you know so scientific ideas they always correlate with the literary because in those days literature was not i am i know i i am not apologetic when i say this philosophers and scientists they were respected better than literature as i told you 1820 only literature came in but before that scientists had a great say philosophers had a great say so of course you know scientists had a great influence right on right literary souls matthew arnold right uh, uh, a whole lot of writers you know took a leaf out of darwin when they were writing on their culture and anarchy so of course yes you know the scientific and you know the, the literary together had a great impact of course you know today when i write so something the pandemic will really affect me right even if i am a doctor or a literature person it's it's surely going to affect me right in that way yes yes sir thank you sir uh, next question is from kadiravan annamalai um he has asked sir as you said britain was full of invaders influenced heavily by the other languages like greek latin and french how did english manage to survive and what role yes. did the church play in the english literary history yes yes good actually very good question how did english manage to survive the simple reason is its flexibility what t s eliot in his cocktail party would say compatibility right incompatible means you know in in digital parlance we use the word compatible is your platform compatible with this so english was very compatible in the sense it was very flexible any language gives you something right it immediately accepted it but pure languages it will never accept it in tamil we use a lot of words that are not part of the tamil vocabulary i'll just give you an example the word kd right in chennai it is very popular it is not a tamil word it's in an english word but we use it in tamil but tamil has not recognized it at all as a tamil word right although in slang we might use it but english recognizes all these words but what the, what it does it it you know grades them for example a mirror was supposed to be the language of the masses but if uh, an elite aristocrat spoke it he will never use the word right he or she uh will never use the word mirror they will use the word looking glass right so of course you know english was able to survive and the yeah the church history also has a say because you know the king james version of the bible compiled by almost 48 scholars they standardized you know not only spelling but also a particular idiom right so they have they also had a say in popularizing the language because the masses read the bible every day in england uh, today they say 65% of the population don't go to church christians right in england but then it was almost everyone was reading that and so the influence was right there yes, um, next question is from uh, sumati shripadi ma'am 
is the word wound similar to the word assault uh no uh, the word wound uh, uh, i get similarity to assault but uh, the word wound means deliberately you know attacking a person like the difference between rob and steal you know rob is you forcefully attack a person and uh, wound is uh, sorry uh, steal means you know secretly surreptitiously you take from a person uh, assault would be a generic term you know a, a, a broader term wound would be i guess it would be a specific term but still there are books right like uh, uh, the best book i would suggest would be word origins and the romantic stories where you definitely have this word there right if you go there you can have a you know a better idea yes sir thank you sir um, the next question is from uh, sahista he has asked sir is there any way of uh, de acclimatizing the speakers to speak in a neutral accent i strongly feel people keep carrying carrying their mother tongue accent along yes that's very true a very very sensible question right many speakers they carry their mother tongue along with them but it is not a matter of shame at all i would always say it should be a matter of pride when the mother tongue neutral accent yes of course because today the world needs what is called even when we are asked to teach you know we don't go by the american accent the british accent we go for a neutral accent but we should never be ashamed ask i am just giving you an example uh, just for the sake of it ask a malayali right he will always say college but he will be proud of the way he uses the word uh, you know we had students you know uh, they will never use the word lollipop they will say lollipop lollipop but they are proud of it right the moment you are proud of this interlanguage interference then you are celebrating your regional identity also which is very important for you for your identity so that you are not stereotyped right so you should be proud of that at the same time you should also make sure in official communication right when you write to your uh, you know principal uh, dear sir you are coming ah you can't write like that when you speak maybe you can say you know coming ah going ah right eating ah you can ask right the interlanguage interference good but when you speak in an official uh, there are five gradations here right uh if you can uh, go into re- the word register if you can key in the word register go to bbclearningenglish.com it gives you five from a graded scale of formal informal then personal then intimate registers right uh so if there are five scales there where to use which register right frozen register is there the register of the indian penal code is frozen you cannot manipulate it the register of the 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 holy books you cannot manipulate any word there it is frozen right formal register is there informal in, uh, personal then intimate intimate is only with you and your girlfriend no one else knows that right you will have a signal for your girlfriend or boyfriend no one else will know that so it's called intimate register right yes like that so there is not in, you should not feel right never feel bad when you have your regional accent dominating your speech i would say as you know as practitioners of theory we all say let's celebrate our region when we speak the language there lies our identity yes sir the next question is uh, uh, i mean um, similar to the previous one i think it is an important question uh, this is from abinash the modern abbreviated language and uh, english there is hindi and english used among the young, young generation in the social media is it a boon or a ban for the english language yes you know many ask this because in digital humanities also this is a very important question so the english language is going for a toss right um i i i completely came out of uh, you know uh, a social networking site i was there just for two or three weeks when i got one three word three just three letters for my birthday a person wished me hbd that's it happy birthday right just three letters uh, in those days we used to buy long cards you know 40 rupees 50 rupees and send a person with a lot of words right just hbd that's it that means happy birthday wish but today you know chinuach we gives us a beautiful example right things change times change if you don't adapt to this change you will perish that is the story of things fall apart that is the story of the tragic rokan war right you will have to go with change you can't say dai dau das bus in, in the future right these are all words of the past this today's scenario you will have to embrace but at the same time you should also know where to draw the line right 
so that is also very important english is good tinglish is good tanglish is good right because you know we don't have one variety today there are varieties we don't have one truth truths we don't have english englishes so we celebrate it at the same time we should know where to draw the line there in lies right the success of usage thank you sir this is uh, the next question is from uh, ramya muttumohan uh, does english literature in particular can have a pragmatic impact on the shaping of cultural cultural identity or social conflicts of a nation of course of course right mccallis minute told us that and in the 19th century there was a great poet um his name is byron he gave he was also professor of poetry at oxford he said if you don't throw them a few books of literature they will throw back a few stones at you so of course books of literature help in culturing a person based on what we read right of course we are products of the reading that we do right the reading you know that we engage with Uh, milton says no a good book is the precious life blood of a master spirit kept and embalmed for a life beyond life it has an impact some books make us cry some books take us to another world right so of course they help us in conditioning our lives making us better human beings but the choice of book is yours yes sir thank you sir uh, the next one is from uh, dr ratna Uh, sir i see english literature terminology is much seen in christianity and uh, freemasonry can you throw some light upon this uh, can you repeat uh, i see i see english literature terminology is much seen in christianity and the freemasonry f r e e m a s o n r y can you yes. throw some light upon this yes obviously that is because you know it was born the language was born in england which was the center of christianity so of course you know the book of common prayer the king james version and the reformation and religious controversies that happened in 1516 right uh, 1516 1517 1518 these three years were very important because 1516 martin luther published his 95 thesis and it had a great influence on christianity the protestant reformation came up and there was a division people had to choose either between the pope or martin luther there was a crisis and so everyone's personal experience was conditioned by the language and of course the majority there were christians and and of course right the influence of the language on this and freemasonry was definitely convincingly there yes. thank you sir and many participants were asking for the uh, name of the book that you bought in vela cherry yes 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 vela cherry that uh, that from where you you learned the evaluation of uh, alphabets yes. yes it's a wonderful book actually after at least one year spontaneously you know um, uh, you know so, uh, bolt from the blue i got this book it's called world origins and the romantic stories i i would suggest it's a must read right for all of us because tomorrow when we engage with others for example a scientist or a doctor you know any word in uh, the, the longest word in english is called the oxford dictionary gives you not i right nimono ultra microscopic silico volcano coniosis this is the longest word in english you go into the oxford dictionary you will see the word nimono ultra microscopic silico volcano coniosis every word part of the word there if you cut it you will get the medical fraternity won't know it but, uh, uh, you know but we will know it we can help them english for nurses english for doctors english for legal profession most of the words we have bona fide you know bona fide in good faith latin words right or uh, you know uh, most of the words we have today so word origins and the romantic stories by wilfred funk right it's a pink book it's a beautiful dark pink book um, i think it will help us see the language from a better light thank you sir as you uh, mentioned in your lecture if time permits you'd be sharing a few stories on alphabets Uh, people have started asking this too one have asked uh, the story on the al I mean, alphabet letter a and one uh, named shiba leme asked we have 10 minutes more sir uh, sir said if he had time to end he would share something with this it would be yes. better if he says some story some story okay okay thank you thank you i'm so happy that you know as uh, you know um, um, 
people who engage with the language and literature i think this makes a lot of sense for us and we'll be surprised also to know that you know most of these letters have beautiful stories to them for example the letter a that uh, you know that is the first letter of the alphabet in fact the word alphabet itself comes from the first two letters of greek one is called alpha the first one bet means the second one right the 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 letter a just look at how it is positioned right it's like a triangle in those days right the phoenicians i'm i'm not talking anything from wikipedia i am taking everything from this book right or from david crystal's cambridge encyclopedia of language right nothing from wikipedia so word origins and the romantic stories the 13th or 15th page you know it says uh, this beautiful example right the letter a how it came to us why is the symbol like this why is not the symbol else you know in a different way he says the phoenicians they respected they venerated and they found the cow as a great source of nourishment for their everyday lives because you know uh, uh, any human being always wanted three things as essentials right food clothing and shelter all these things were given by the cow or the buffalo or the bullocks or the oxen right together and so out of great veneration and respect the first letter was original like this you know inverted triangle like this v and then over a period of time it evolved like this you know it, it, till a uh, uh, considerable uh, period of time it was like this without the vertical bar right on it uh, you know without the i am sorry the horizontal bar on it after that you have the horizontal bar on it and you have the present a as it is so out of respect you know because it gave you it gave us our everything right so the first letter is based on the cow and uh, the second letter b which also means b e t h means house the second thing that they needed in life was a place to reside so the the letter b if you carefully see it one part of the semicircle the first part will be smaller and the second one will be a bit bigger right that is because there were two compartments in the house uh, i'm not saying any of these it's there in the book for you you can please access the book buy the book online and uh, start reading the whole book around uh, 350 odd pages but every page is absorbing this you know the word beth means house the first part is for the men folk they'll be there guarding the house it seems sounds sexist as if the men are the guardians of the house but still they were in the front part of the house they were guarding the house and the second part was bigger because all the women folk the cooking everything was done there in the women's you know parlor uh, in in french you use the word boudoir b o u d o i r a women's personal room no like that boudoir right so everything was done in the second half while the first part was was for the men so the word b the word c out of veneration for the sun so every letter of the alphabet right the word h gives a fencing around the house fencing that we do around the house like that each letter has a beautiful story for it um but i think if i tell you the stories you won't read the book so please uh, you can uh, you know go uh, you know after you log out i think it should be you know uh, available online also you can read them right uh, yeah. sir i think i can stop with this one last question yes sir ramesh bhai sir yes sir yes, please yes sir and um, this is the question that i have i have to ask personally i wish to ask personally i believe that this would be the voice of many participants many literarian uh, uh, many literarians uh, listening to your lecture too uh, many educational bodies are insisting on online education online teaching and uh, we literarians we uh, I mean uh, uh, english teachers we are a bit reluctant and skeptical to teach uh, through online mode because we deal with emotions we have the question or we have the uh, doubt that whether the same emotion will be balanced on the other side on the on the student side also and as you <clears throat> pointed out the uh, examples of potato uh, we will be real we teach realism we can teach realism through online uh, mode but uh, won't we fail in teaching naturalism what is your take on this sir ah uh, yes this is a very good question 
but uh, this this has a lot of components to it mm-hmm. but i would say you know like i said about the chinavachi example sometimes we will have to embrace change last week i was listening to a lecture uh, just 3 days back in american college where a professor from canada if i'm right yes um, he gave us a wonderful example of how today time right and energy has helped me from canada to connect with you all in this part of the world a kind of you know an a virtual platform which we would never even have thought of but you know in the past just one year back we would never even have thought that people from all parts of the world will congregate here in this virtual platform kannadasan gives the beautiful you know two lines that come to my mind when i say this sorry for using you know tamil for the sake of the others who don't know tamil i'll say in tamil and translate illada nedi onril eludada nadagathai ellorum paarkirom ellorum rasikirom right illada nedi onril eludada nadagathai ellorum paarkirom ellor that means that the stage is not there the real platform is not there where am i i am there in your room in your you know uh, in your sitting room i am there you know wherever you are maybe in, in your car you are there you know with me in chennai but still this you know everywhereness although i am here there is an everywhereness to me that happens and i'm sure of course the very good point that you raised you know emotions cannot be uh, reflected on the online you know media the way that we do it because desmond morris has written a book called the people's guide to body language you know it's around 890 pages a huge book he says 78% of our speech is based on body language right the way i communicate you know uh, body language the way i walk you know um, we have had our teachers no who used to act out scenes from shakespeare but here in this little space it's difficult for us to do that but still right necessity is the mother of invention and i'm sure in no time right we all would embrace it and you would find this more engaging also uh, you know uh, with all due respects to the real medium the virtual also has its aura its own comfortable cozy space in your own homes where you can no disturbance you can sit relaxed and enjoy so there are uh, you know either sides to it two sides to it it depends on how we do the blend like we do the blend in the coffee thank you thank you thank you sir oh, we will have only one minute yes sir. uh professor rufus there is one question here uh, from gri yes. prasad uh, briefly explaining what is the importance of plain english what's the importance of plain 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 english plain english ah very good plain english yeah english. yeah plain english very good see p sainath has written a wonderful essay the tower of gabel this would be an answer this would be the right answer to what professor has asked a very sensible very wonderful question on pain english p sainath he is with the hindu um, now he is in the us if i'm right he has written an essay richard ledrer would be the second answer richard ledrer says you know uh, the the case or the argument for plain english instead of using a bombastic words that don't mean anything you know if you look at your insurance policy there will be a whole lot of risk factors you will never be able to read 16 pages of it but at the end of it you know someone will ask you to sign right you will just sign you know any agreement document that you do you won't understand head or tail of it because they have the luxury of making it complicated why when you complicate things it is easier for them when they simplify things you have a lot of questions that is why today there is a campaign for plain english to simplify things it's a very sensible question richard ledra l e d e r e r richard ledra leads this campaign for plain english he calls it you know use minimum letters in a word don't use complicated words like you know anti disestablishmentarianism why do you want to use such bombastic words so today sir has beautifully given us a summation if i if i should say the case for plain english is the need of the hour subhanan i'm so thankful to you for raising this wonderful question from sir actually that is the need of the hour okay um, 
moderator please wind up yes sir uh, thank you sir thank you for the wonderful lecture uh, this actually this is a uh, you have given a new insight into uh, language and the and its aspects really it, it is useful for all, it is useful for all of us and uh, thank you for accepting our invitation to and uh, with this i i wish to wind up and uh, i thank all the organizing uh, the team members for giving me the opportunity and uh, organizing it in a very successful manner too and uh, I, sir do you have word to say on uh, regarding tomorrow's program or uh, shall i close yes it? no 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 yes yes oh to mark sir mark sir yes sir yes mark sir uh, i'm strong sir is there no 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 Okay. Sir is here. I am not able to find him out. Okay. Uh, no, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rufus. Uh, it, it, so it was it was a very very uh, enriching, illuminating, very informative session. Uh, I have I have listened to your uh, lectures on eco studies. Uh, I have even uh, listened to you, uh, you know, delivering a talk on uh, uh, the uh, archetypes. Uh, especially James Fraser's his Golden Bow was part of your PhD open uh, defense. Uh, I, so I have I have listened to your lectures on uh, eco studies, uh, green literature, postmodernism, and all such things. And I was informed that uh, uh, this specific uh, topic, the trajectory, uh, the history of uh, English language studies, English literary studies. Uh, I was informed that uh, you have exclusively prepared this specific thing for uh, this workshop. I'm very, very glad to know that, and uh, I, I could all of us could easily uh, understand, you know, how much of hard work and uh, research, uh, you know, strenuous research, have gone into the making of this kind of a very, very, very informative, uh, very fruitful, uh, very meaningful lecture. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rufus, uh, for sir. this you, for sir. this very precise. very informative uh, piece of lecture uh, dear participants we are also happy to uh, inform you that uh, to tomorrow uh, we have two important sessions uh, i'm sure there will be an earthquake in the literary landscape in our own literary workshop uh, tomorrow morning with uh, uh, professor s prabhakar's lecture on digital humanities and again uh, in the afternoon session we have our uh, beloved Uh, Dr. Sikumbusu Mangadi from the University of Johannesburg, South Africa. Again, he comes again to uh, to to deliver a very powerful uh, talk on the language debate that is going on in South Africa. So, uh, with with these two, uh, you know, very very useful and meaningful lectures, uh, I, I I assure you, you will have uh, a very very pleasant and very meaningful. a day tomorrow a uh, session two uh, two sessions tomorrow so please be present and uh, enjoy the the uh, forthcoming sessions tomorrow thank you thank you one and all uh, and let us wind up this session if uh, subhu has any instructions to the audience no 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 okay tomorrow is sunday that you have to mention that happy sunday <laughs> happy sunday <laughs> Okay. looking forward thank to you. meet you all thank you thank you thank you thank, thank you rufus thank you so much thank you thank you thank you rufus thank you so much thank you thank you thank you, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it was my it was mind blowing and I, i i just have one word to say like you know oh, you thank you've you. made heaven out of hell oh great thank That's you nice. thank you it means a lot thank it means a lot to me i can't thank you thank you thank you bye thank you thank you thank you bye bye thank you yeah thank you all